here at the 20th International Conference on Comparative Cognition in Melbourne, Florida. And this year, our Comparative Cognition Society honoree is Al Camel. And Al has been gracious enough to uh, answer a few questions about his career in, in Comparative Cognition. So thank you, Al. Thank you. Al, you're known as a psychologist and a biologist. How do you think of yourselves, and where do you see the, the edge between those two? Um, well, I don't, I don't know how I think of myself. I, I think my interests fall so clearly on the boundary between psychology and biology, and I see the boundary as arbitrary. So I, I, I don't really think about that too much. I think, ideally, to be good at, you know, be, to do the kind of research that I'm interested in doing, you've got to know a lot about psychology, and you've got to know a lot about the biology of the animals you're working with. So. You know, so that's kind of how I, 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 don't, I don't think a lot about that. I've been in the biology department, and I have been for the last 21 plus years, and before that I was in the psychology department uh, for 25 years. And uh, there are advantages and disadvantages to each. I'm, I'm much more comfortable in a biology department, or at least this biology department. Um, and, and so I, if anything, I think I was a little more of a biologist, but I also, at another level, I, I, I actually think that uh, there's two there's two sides of psychology. One side is social science, the other side is um, more biological science, life science, if you prefer. And since biology is generally defined as the study of living organisms and animals and living organisms, I actually think that psychology is a subset of biology. And if it's only because of history, the accidents of history and how universities are organized with, with psychology coming more out of philosophy um, than out of uh, biology. Mm -hmm. uh, historically, that's that's the reason why we're separated the way we are. If there was a different history, um, we probably wouldn't be separated. That might be a good thing. Yeah, so the separation has kind of set different agendas in biology and psychology. Mm -hmm. and kind of, <laughs> so it, maybe it was just how it kind of worked out academically, as you, as you said, and that's a big component of it. So your approach, you know, the synthetic approach, and you're one of the pioneers of that, and and have written about that extensively. So, so what do you think has been the, the biggest assets of that? The biggest there. assets? Yes. I think you know when when I first got interested in a more biological approach, which was about five years after I got my PhD, um, and as I'll talk about tonight, and there, there were some things I was learning and as I uh, was working with uh, these blue jays, these corvids, um, that made me realize that I needed to, to take a more biological approach to answer the questions I was interested in. So I went and started learning some biology, sitting in some courses, reading the literature, and so on. I went through, I don't know, three or four years maybe of, of feeling my way and learning the jargon, and the, that is the technical language uh, of this other discipline that I didn't understand very well. And um, I was fortunate enough to have some colleagues and some people I met, biologists, who uh, helped me a lot in doing that. Um, and and I, I guess I feel, I feel that knowing um, a lot about biology and how biology does research, and especially since I've been in a biology department, um, it just adds a number of tools to your toolkit and makes makes you a better scientist, I think, and it puts things in a, in a different perspective. And uh, I had a conversation last night with uh, uh, a traditional animal learning psychologist who works with one of the standard species, um, and I was, I looked at a poster and uh, they were asking pigeons to do something that they're really not very good at. And, <laughs> Um, and there's actually a fairly large literature on this particular problem with pigeons. And the thing is that, that there are a number of corvid species who are much better at it. I mean, they learn faster, they learn more complicated examples of it. And the question that's being asked in the poster could have been answered much better. <laughs> with, you know, and, and I said something to, to this person about it. I just don't understand why people insist on keep doing this kind of work with pigeons, given what we know. And the answer was, well, we just have to learn how to be better experimentalists with pigeons. 
implicit with pigeons. And I walked away from that thinking, that's just, why isn't being a better experimentalist being better at picking the species you work with? <laughs> because most biologists, um, I mean, they may be interested in a particular animal or group of animals, but they look for the general questions that are important and then look for the right system to work in. And that's true of microbiologists and plant biologists and zoologists. And, and you know, we have a research and design series in our Ecology Evolution Behavior Program was the magistrates required to get up twice during their career and give presentations about the research they're proposing to do before they do it. So often they've done a little and now they're ready to really start working on their thesis. Mm -hmm. And if they don't start off by saying what the general biological question of general interest is and why the system they're working with is a good good system, not species, but system to work with, which includes the species, the set of species, they just get slaughtered. <laughs> I mean, the faculty just... <laughs> you know, it's just, they're, they're really, and my point is, they're, they're trained to do something that, um, in my experience in psychology departments, is not taught in the same way. And that, that, that they're taught to think about, try to think about which are the important questions, what are the criteria to determine what are important questions, and then how do you go about picking a system that you have a good chance of answering that question? And I don't, I just don't think psychologists do that very much. Um, you know, there are things that, we, that that are interesting in the literature. People get interested in those things, but they they all, you know, I don't want to say they never do because obviously you know, a lot of people do think about well, how is this generally important, but but they don't really start that way, and uh, I think that limits what. Severely limits what they can do. I would agree with that completely. So, in 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 your comments there, you mentioned one of the species that you've been working with in the blue jays. Um, so, how did you? What 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 brought you to that? And in, in, in search image formation, which was you know, the, the, one of the more influential pictures that you wrote years ago with Sending uh, Petrovich. Yeah. Um, that's actually two different questions. <laughs> because I started working with blue jays and was only six to nine years later that we came up with the search image. I didn't start working with blue jays because of that question. Um, I'm going to talk, talk, well, it doesn't matter that I'm going to talk about it tonight, I'll talk about it for this audience. But what happened was that I, after as an undergraduate, I worked with a psychologist named Robert Gossett who had a lot of different species in the lab, all sorts of things. Caimans, minor birds, pigeons, squirrel monkeys, spider monkeys. I can't remember all the other things. And minor birds, which is what I worked with. And I got interested, and he really thought there were a lot of differences in learning among birds. And he and he also was a big proponent of serial, serial reversal learning as a good comparative tool. And the reversal index, which is kind of a ratio of performance and acetone. Number of errors in the. I don't remember <laughs> the details. Um, and so that, that kind of interest it introduced me to that idea is he was not at all biological in, in the least. Um, but I got used to the idea of having different species around, and Gossett really loved the challenge of figuring out how to test the new species. I mean, he, he just really enjoyed that, and I picked some of that up. It's fun um, and challenging. And so I got interested in complex learning in birds, and then so I decided that I did an honors thesis on serial reversal learning in minor birds. And they did very well. And, uh, and I was one of those undergraduates that did the honors thesis that never published. It. I think they re ran it because they got constantly published some minor bird data <laughs> about five years later, and I'm sure he was, was not very happy with me. I don't blame him. In retrospect, but anyway, um, and so I, and I went to Wisconsin. The reason I went to Wisconsin was I thought I would do learning set of birds, and, and I was accepted into Harry Hollow's lab, and he was the inventor of learning set. Mm -hmm. And I wrote this essay about how I wanted to come, and this is what I wanted to do, you know, as part of my application. And I get to uh, Madison, and I'm ushered into the great man's office. You know, I am almost literally, you know, just out of 
I graduated like three weeks before. <laughs> and I'm in Harry Hall's office, mm -hmm. and he's sitting there, and he's got my application on his desk. And Harry was a strange fellow, funny, brilliant, strange. And he looks, and I can see he's got the essay there. And he looks at me and says, well, let's see, Mr. Cowell, didn't you want to work on social behavior? And looking back on it, I'm kind of amazed at what my response was. And I said, no. <laughs> <laughs> you know, looking back on it, but I really didn't. And I was just floored that he had my essay in front of him and he asked me this question. <laughs> so, so it was real, it's a real interesting interaction with, with Harlow. And, and So did he have an influence on you? Because you, you really want to study intelligence and animals. And of course, Harlow is... is if not one of the most important figures in, in that role of studying the intelligence in the animals, set out all the different types of tasks and approaches. Did that have an impact on you? He did, so he did some of the brilliant early work on classical conditioning. Mm -hmm. He did. I, he, he's, an inter, he's an interesting man because he went through about four distinct phases in his career. And when I got there, uh, he decided he wasn't going to do any more learning and he was going to concentrate on the, the, the social development effects of social isolation, mm -hmm. and that's all that he was going to be involved in. That's why, and I think he probably accepted me, I did have a strong record, but I came from a school he probably never heard of, but I, there were monkeys in the lab, and I knew how to take care of them, and handle them. Mm -hmm. I suspect that's probably why I got it. That's why <laughs> they at least don't work with Harlow. Mm -hmm. And I think Harlow influenced me in, in a lot of ways. Uh, uh, but I really, you know, I, he was not my advisor. He, what he did, and this is typical Harry, he never told me he did this, and I didn't find out he did it three years later. But he went to a new faculty member who come in, John Davenport, and said to Davenport, you know, I've got this student I thought would work on social behavior, he doesn't want to, and he's interested in learning, he said, why don't you become his advisor? And Davenport shows up at my desk one day and said, oh, I think we have some interests in common, why don't we talk? Mm -hmm. And no one ever said to me, Carl, who did this, you know, and then, then, then it was very, it was done very uh, smoothly. And Harry, you know, those that were those were the days of lots of money in the primary center and all that. He just went out and got another graduate student <laughs> <laughs> who who did who worked on the project, you know, one of the projects he wanted me to work on probably. And I, but I did work on my research assistantship for that first period of time I was there. I did school the social behavior of normal and isolated research monkeys on uh, a PhD project, which was a good learning experience for me. I strongly disliked the work. I couldn't have done that kind of work, mm -hmm. but uh, um, I, learned, I learned a lot about methodology and how to watch behavior and things like that from that experience that served me a good step. We use some of the ideas from that in some of one of our most recent PDJ pieces of research. <laughs> so the idea of a play group, you know, where they did it with primates, we tried that with PDJs, it worked very well. Not isolation or anything, but to study uh, dominance hierarchies in, in PDJs. Um, and, and Wisconsin was, was a good place for me in many ways, but, but um, the one way it wasn't good was I wasn't allowed to do what I really wanted to do. And just, just you know, Harry didn't want any more to call Harry goddamn non primates in the primate lab, because they were already rats and rabbits and a couple other things, maybe. And John thought that the idea of doing learning center in a bird was not going to work, and then it would be a thesis, and I'd be in trouble. Mm -hmm. And then I, and I, so I, I I decided well, I have to get that <laughs> so I could do what I want. So I did. Uh, I, I did a project for my thesis that, that I was interested in, some enough to do it because it was a hell of a lot of work. But I could do it in a year, and so I got my master's. It took me almost three years to get my master's because I kept trying to do studies with monkeys, and it just I couldn't get them to work. I mean, it wasn't the monkeys' fault, you know, so. Even then, I knew the animals always right. <laughs> <laughs> and funny, because one of the things I tried to do, but I thought of it as it was kind of based on a verbal learning paradigm. Teach them A, B, B, C, and the test them on easy. Mm -hmm. right? I tried to do that with Reese's Monkeys in 1965, and we just couldn't get it to work in the WGTA. I mean, we just couldn't get the basic test to work. Mm -hmm. I'm sure the monkeys would have done it. It's a hot area, it's been a hot area of research recently. <laughs> I often wonder well, how my life would have been different if I hadn't worked. We just just had the kind of apparatus available that we have now. And so, but um, so I got so I, so I so I I got out of graduate school, and in those days, 
you generally didn't do a postdoc. The only reason you do a postdoc is because there was a way if you wanted to learn how they did something, then you go there, but because there were lots of jobs. Unfortunately, not true anymore. And so I went to, I was offered a job at the University of Massachusetts, and it was a good situation. And I set up a bird lab, and I wanted to get smart birds. I knew that if you ask any ornithologist, you know, you, you know, if, if I wanted to study a smart bird, which group would, you, would I, should I study? I knew none of them would answer pigeon or chicken. <laughs> and I knew, and I knew in fact that one of the answers you would get commonly was well, the, the two most common answers in the were parrot or cord. And so I didn't want to do parrots because I wanted to be able to control the early experience of the birds because my experience with minor birds told me because the, you, you buy these minor birds that have been horrendously treated with the pet trade before you got them. It's really a major problem to get up to settle down and habituate the humans and so on. Um, and so I went out looking for corvids. And you didn't need a license to capture birds back then. <laughs> of anything. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I was after crows, and we got some crows. And Max Hunter was my first PhD student at UMass and I. Uh, and, and someone called me and said, oh, I understand you're looking for crows, and I found some blue jays. Why don't you try them too? That's why I got started. Crows were very, turned out to be difficult. Mm -hmm. um, if I had to, if I, had, if I did it over again, I, I'd know a lot more about how to work with birds now. I'm sure crows would have been good, but blue jays were much easier. Mm -hmm. And they gave beautiful data, and uh, Skinner said, follow the data. Right? If, you get, if you get orderly data, follow that up. Mm -hmm. We got really nice data out of the blue jays, so we dropped the other species. We tried, we tried several other species. And concentrate on the blue jay, not because I thought they were smarter or, you know, than other corvids, but they were a really good lab. And they are, I mean, for my first blue jays in the laboratory in 1968, we're still not blue jays. Have continuous mm -hmm. So, what got you into the search image formation? Yeah, so, I don't have a short answer, so it's a long answer. But um, what happened was we did all this learning set work in Blue Jays, and we did about six or seven years of work on it, and we found that they learned the learning set really well. Not as well as rhesus monkeys, quite. But at percent correct on trial two of new problems was around 80, 85, sometimes even 90 percent, depending on the details of how you ran it. And, and that's better than you know, squirrel monkeys or marmosets or cats. It's better than a lot of mammals. And one of the things we know, should know in comparative psychology is just because two species perform similarly at the, at the level of what they choose, that doesn't mean they're doing it in the same way. And so we launched a, I launched a program of research. We were able to short-term memory, long-term memory, object prep, all kinds of things. Replicating, for the most part, 90 plus percent of what we're doing is replicating the theoretically most important findings with rhesus monkeys and chimpanzees and learning set. And we replicated every single phenomenon, every single one replicated, including most critically back to reversal learning, reversal learning transcripts and learning set. And so, and, and, and an amusing thing, I got my first NSF claim to do that, to do that. After we demonstrated the good performance, and I always remember one review, I, I got funded, my first proposal got funded. Um, it was a little, it was easier back then, the hit rate was higher, but it was still kind of surprising. But I remember one reviewer said, you know, I'm not really sure it's worth doing this kind of work. But if you're going to do it, this is the right way. To do it. <laughs> well, you know, since I got the money, I didn't complain. <laughs> and uh, but what? So at the end of that project, the answer to the question was: Blue Jay, you know, do Blue Jays do learning set like monkeys do? Yes, they learn the wind state and shift strategy. They show all the characteristics of that. And. Um, so one way to put the result is to say that when it comes to learning set performance, rhesus monkeys are more like blue jays than they are like squirrel monkeys. That's an accurate statement. Mm -hmm. And it's also accurate to say that blue jays are more like monkeys than they are like pigeons. Mm -hmm. So how do you explain that? You can't explain it on the basis of phylogeny. They're not more closely related to 
Blue Jays are not more closely related to Reese's Pumpkins than they are pigeons, obviously. Um, they have a much more recent common ancestor, etc. So what alternative way is there to think about differences? And the answer, of course, is function. And it's, I mean, it's a well-known phenomenon in biology that you can get similarities between distantly related species because of similar selective function. And it's called convergence. So I, I realized that fairly quickly, but then I tried to think about applying that idea to learning set, and the trouble with learning set and a lot of other laboratory learning tests is not that you can't think of a connection, possible connection between the task and the natural history of the animal, which is what you have to look at, you know, look at convergence, but that you can think of a hundred ways, <laughs> and you couldn't, I couldn't think of good ways to test any of them. And so I gave up on that, and, I, and I, what I did was I, I decided what I have to do is I have to find situations by looking at what animals actually do in nature where they use learning, and then figure out how to study that kind of learning. Mm -hmm. And so let the animals tell me what kind of learning I should do at the end. And so I, start, I started reading the field literature on animals. And I was lucky, if, if I had that idea 10 years sooner, I couldn't have I don't think I would have gotten very far, and maybe, but probably not, because this was in the early 70s, and a lot of developments were happening in biology that resulted in field studies where individual identifiable animals were followed over long periods of time. So you can see changes in behavior in individuals, which is what you need to know about, the question I was interested in. Ten years before that, there were extremely few studies. There still weren't a lot, but they were, they were, they were, they were, they were a fair number, but they weren't classified in a way that was useful to me. So I just started reading the literature on field studies of birds. And chronologically, the first idea was the nectar feeding idea. The idea that nectar feeding birds need to avoid flowers that have recently emptied. There were strong hints in the literature that they did this, and you know, it could be a learned behavior, why not? And so I, I, when I actually did that work, I actually came first. And, uh, and then the search image came up in the same kind of way. Uh, I had interest in the predator prey literature, um, and I had a colleague in zoology, Ted Sarger, who studied these moths. And they're very cryptic moths. And blue jays are really good at finding them visually. And there was this idea in the literature called search image, which was the idea that if a predator searching for cryptic prey finds several of them in a row, it gets better at detecting selective attention, presumably. Mm -hmm. And actually, if you read what some of the, you know, what biologists were saying about it, they may not have used the phrase selective attention, I think actually one of them did. But that was clearly what they were talking about. You, you get better at finding one thing, you get worse at finding other things. As, but the problem was, and there were a lot of studies claiming to demonstrate search image, but none of them really did a good job. And the difficulty in putting lab and field work together, or I don't know if difficulty is not the right word in my mind, um, is that in the field it's, very, it's much more difficult to control the variables you want. But at least you know you're working with something that is really important. But you can't control things. So in the lab, you can really control things. But unless you're really careful about it, you can easily end up studying something that's really not very important outside mm -hmm. of the lab. But that'd be phenomenal. Mm -hmm. And so we were in, in my lab, we were really interested in search image. And we had blue jays. And they were the main visual predators on these moths. And Ted had moths. And, knowledge about moths, which is quite a kind of technique where you could control the timing and sequence of things, of, of, predator, of predator encounters with prey. And we must have thought about that and talked about it at lab meetings for, coming, for months and months without coming up with anything. And then, that was fun. And then, um, 
Dick Hernstein came to Amherst and gave a talk on concept formation of visions. And it was, you know, he, he published that. He published the science article with that title a couple of years before. Mm -hmm. And he's, he's giving his talk, and I'm sitting there listening to it. And, and I, I still remember it, just like a flashbulb went off, you know, and I went, holy shit. <laughs> not pigeons, blue jays, not trees, moths. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And everything followed from that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that was funny. If I, I, I don't know if I ever would have occurred to me to do that if Ernestine hadn't come and given that talk and I hadn't gone to it. It's an interesting question. I don't know. Yeah, no, it's a great story. <laughs> so, so another major component of your, your research area has been spatial cognition. Mm -hmm. so, so what got you going along those lines? And Same kind of story. I, I was reading... Uh, Morphological field literature, and I ran into this paper that talked about the caching and recovery behavior of nutcrackers. And it sounded to me, from what was known, there were some field studies that suggested that it's possible that these birds actually remembered where they put their seeds. And there was this ecologist, uh, ornithologist at Northern Arizona University named Russ Baldwin. Um, and I, I would go, I went occasionally at least to ornithological meetings. And I went to an ornithology meeting and I saw he was on the program, so I went looking for him. And when I found him, I went up and said, Oh, I've been looking for you, you know, I'm out He said, Oh, he says, I've been looking for you. <laughs> <laughs> and someone had told him, I think it was George Baldwin, uh, who knew me, that, 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 that he'd been talking to, to uh, I think it was George. Say, you know, I really need a psychologist or something about learning and memory and be interested in working on this problem with these left practice with me. And George said, oh, you guys, you got to meet Al Camel. <laughs> so, and that was the start of that collaboration. And uh, you know, it was a great collaboration for almost 30 years mm -hmm. until Russ retired, mm -hmm. uh, So that's, it's, it's, so it's a similar, similar story. Um, stimulated by uh, those articles and then by Russ's knowledge. And Russ already, he had a paper in press that and that demonstrated uh, memory in one Eurasian nutcracker that he did when he was on Spadal in Germany. He, uh, something, there was, a, there was a, an eruption of the, of the nutcrackers out of the mountains into, into the pine cone crop was to fail that year. And that happens, they erupt out of the mountains because they can't. They'll starve to death if they stay in the mountains. So, uh, lots of star anyway when they leave the mountains. But anyway, and so he, he, got, he caught one in uh, Bielefeld and tested it in a room with a dirt floor. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, got, he got sedated. He pretty clearly showed highly likely to be some kind of memory. Uh, the thing that wasn't at all clear, and Vanderwall had done a study, and Russ was his advisor on the study, his majesty. Ice outdoor, you can get every study. Actually, I don't know if Russ was his advisor. Russ was his advisor, he may have. Vanderbilt may have done the study after he left North Arizona, I can't remember. Um, but if I see you every study that showed memory and showed that it probably involved landmarks. Um, but the question was, so the question was, it, it, the answer that it was, was memory were well, high, but what kind of memory, memory for what? Uh, that was not at all clear. And to do that, it was a similar problem in some ways in the search image. You had to figure out a way to study cash recovery behavior, cash and recovery behavior, where you could control things. And that's where, and, and I remember going out to Flagstaff, again, spending days trying to think of a way to do that. And I remember sitting on the floor in Russ's living room with a fire going in the middle of the winter. <laughs> About a foot and a half of snow on the ground. And all of a sudden, the idea, I don't remember, I don't think even saying which one of us had the idea. Neither of us would have had it at all. To build this room with these discrete holes in the floor, and we could cap the holes. And, but we didn't know if birds would do it, if they cache in holes like that. And we didn't know if they cached, would they recover. There's a kind of a bizarre situation in some ways for that. But and I remember how exciting it was when we read the first birds in the world. It was one of those cases where the very first try just worked. 
And in fact, cash recovery behavior, remember cash memory and cash recovery behavior are extremely robust the phenomenon in nutcrackers. <laughs> Unlike some other birds I've studied today, you, you, it's, nutcrackers really just give them the chance to do it, but they'll do it. So when you, when you look at your body of work and you ask yourself, what have been some of your favorite publications? Stay versus shift learning in hummingbirds. That was a science paper in 81 or 82. And we very explicitly, in the last paragraph of that paper, talked about an ecological approach to learning. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I've had several people tell me that paper's not been cited, that one has been cited, but, but maybe a hundred times over the years, something like that. Not bad, but not. Not nearly as much as the search engine paper, for example. Um, but I had a number of people who never cited it tell me how important that paper was to them because of that last paragraph. In part because of that last paragraph. So that's certainly one of my favorites. Mm -hmm. And there's one that nobody cites, <laughs> not many people know about, but Sarah Shettleworth put it in her book, surprised the heck out of me. <laughs> but Bernie Heinrich of um, the, the Black biologist who did all this beautiful work on bumblebees and more recently been working on social intelligence ravens. Um, and I knew, I knew Bernie and, and, uh, and I really admired his bumblebee work. It was kind of, it started in the 70s and early 80s and it was really groundbreaking work, beautiful work. And um, he had this idea, he was looking at these caterpillars. He was at the University of Vermont. We used to get together once a while and go to people talk. We had to come down and give a talk. And um, he had this idea that he noticed that when you looked at the pattern in which caterpillars ate leaves, that some caterpillars ate leaves. Well, it was at random. You could easily detect the leaves that they've been eating because they just when they got done eating, the leaf the leaf shape changed a lot. But other caterpillars ate the leaves very neatly in a way that preserved the and he thought, and he also, and he noticed that the ones that ate sloppy, left, you know, whereas obviously the meeting were aposematic, they were brightly colored and distasteful, and the ones that were more discreet about them eating leaves, should I say, right, say, were the ones that were cryptic and very tasty. And he thought, well, the reason for this difference is that the cryptic ones, the, they are more that cryptic. I don't want to phrase this in terms of what like, cognition of the caterpillar, I don't think there is any, uh, at least not about this, uh, not about anything. But anyway, the, the caterpillars that were good to eat and ate leaves sloppily were leaving behind a cue that a predator could use to find them and thus would survive. And so he thought it was a different selection pattern on the caterpillars mm -hmm. because the aposematic ones didn't care for them, found them would eat them. And so he he took pictures of these leaves and sent them to a pen reel who was a postdoc. And we did a, a kind of a concept formation. We used different responses, but and we basically we took I think we took just one leaf, one exemplar of each, and, and then we did the mirror image and we rotated it so there were eight. It was the same exemplar but in eight different poses. Square this, you know, up for, you know, ninety degree rotation and. And they learned it pretty fast, actually. And then we showed them new leaves that never been seen before. They generalized virtually perfectly. Mm -hmm. And uh, there, there was a, 
there was a lot of work that had been done with that, but there was too much other stuff going on for me, and none of my students picked up on it, so we published that one paper. That's, that's one of my favorite papers, just because it's just cool. <laughs> it's cool, and, and I don't, don't know that one. <laughs> it's in Cyrus' book. It was published in Animal Learning and Behavior in sometime in the 80s. Mm -hmm. So that one's good. I mean, certainly the you know the original search image papers, the nutcrackers and the nutcracker papers, and you know, and a lot of the best work uh, that I've been involved in in my career has been, been the collaborative work with Alan Mott. And we've been working together now for about 20 years. We've known each other since he was a postdoc in Al Riley's lab at Berkeley. And <laughs> a lot of people at this conference were in Al Riley's lab at the time, and so we've known each other, been friends, but we. They ever worked together, and our interests were very parallel um, until we both ended up in Lincoln, Nebraska, and, uh, and collaborated uh, for a long time. And I think the work that we did on uh, how uh, what we call virtual ecology, uh, how the characteristics of the search of the J's, the search image aspects of it, as well as the general detection aspects, to drive the evolution. Of and that was one of the original reasons for the search image hypothesis was to try to explain diversity and appearance of prey. And so that had long been a hypothesis about why there's polymorphisms in uh, prey that are highly favored, you know, highly favored by predators because to foil the search image of the predator. But we actually, you know, we actually did a study that tested that very, as directly, perhaps as you could, by having blue jays hunt for artificial moths that were based on the real moths that had a in silica, shall we say, genome. And the ones that got found didn't get to breed in the, mem uh, the computer, right? And so to, you give the jays a population of moths to feed on, and you run this selection thing where you look which ones are found, how long it takes to find them. And you have an algorithm where the harder they were to find, the more likely they are to breed. And they actually have a genome. And so you, you, know, you can actually model, you can model actual the genetics of actual reproduction. And they, they definitely increase the diversity. And it's, it's a beautiful thing. And we followed it up with a number of other things, uh, some of which are published, a lot of which is better to be back on the way But, um, I think that paper, in that paper, yeah, one of the things that's different between biology and psychology, and John Krebs pointed this out to me about 25, 30 years ago, at a foraging conference. And he said, you know, the trouble with psychology is it doesn't have any first principles. Biology has first principles. So, so I don't know what you, what do you mean? <laughs> say, well, there are certain fundamental processes that we think drive everything in, in you know, the revolution, basically in various aspects of evolutionary theory, mm -hmm. and first and that tells us what's important. And so one of the other, so so from first principles you know that certain questions really are fundamental because they have to do with these fundamental processes that in the end, produce the diversity of life, which is the, the main challenge of biology, right? So this thing the diversity of life. And, you know, he's right. Yeah, it took me a while to really fully assimilate that. I mean, not to, when I say a while, I mean a few years. Um, and, you know, he's right. The psychology has no first principles like that. Um, but in the case of that particular work, it, it met the first principle. <laughs> I'll keep it away. I think it was important work uh, for that reason. Uh, and I, I also, you remind me, it's, it's not a publication. I mean, it was a couple of books, but one of the things that, that I did when I saw the relationship between different foraging problems and learning was to try to draw together some of the biologists and some of the psychologists who shared interests in similar problems, even if they thought about them differently. And so I organized a big symposium at a behavior society in Seattle. I don't remember what year, in the late 70s, early 80s. I think it was in 79 or 78. 
And uh, and it was kind of funny because I didn't know any of the people who were big names in Florida. Uh, you know, like the general for John Trades and Juan Pulliam. But I kind of stumbled on the strategy to successfully organize it. And supposedly, like, we got some money from NSF. Yes, we got some money from NSF. So I could offer people airfare and lodging. And I went to a couple of the big names first, and they said yes, and then I could write to everyone, so they said, so-and-so, and so-and-so are coming, would you like And then, a lot of, and all these people, they all knew each other, and I didn't know any of them. <laughs> and I, and uh, it was very useful, because I got to meet them, and, and so on. But I think, and we ended up having three of those conferences in two books, uh, two edited volumes. Uh, Ted Sargent and I did one, and Krebs pulled him, and I did the other. I think those were important. I think that those things influence a lot of people on both sides. From the psychologists of microbiology, I don't want to respect the psychologists. That, that was probably one of the more important things I did. Um, and it, it worked out great in a lot of ways. So since we're talking big picture stuff, so, so if you survey comparative cognition right now, what do you, what do you think the future goals should be? I think there are a lot of things about animal cognition we don't, we don't understand. I think one of the, I'm, I'm not that much of a big picture, big picture person. I tend to, you know, I see interesting phenomena, I see questions that I think are important questions or just interesting questions, and I tend to follow my nose. And, so I don't think about those kinds of things much, but certainly I think one of the challenges that we face, I think there's a whole arena of really important, uh, a whole context within which a lot of really important kinds of learning happen that we know almost nothing about, that's social cognition. And I think one of our challenges is going to be to develop good uh, techniques and there's an awful lot of really shoddy work being done in that area. And, and good work. And there's always some shoddy work in any area. Uh, but there's an unusual concentration of it right now <laughs> in that area. And, but they're very difficult uh, experiments to figure out how to do and how to, to balance the, what I call them, internal and external validity, the ability to control variables and, and working in a way that you know that your work has a good chance of being relevant to what goes on outside of the context of this particular experiment. And you, know, you want to have all kinds of validity in the long run. So I think, I think that's one of the challenges that we face. That's a really interesting challenge. I also think that um, th there's going to be, uh, how should I put this? Back up a little bit. So being in a biology department for the last 21 years, one of the things I've seen happen is molecular biology you can phrase it a couple of different ways. You can say, well, molecular biology is invaded almost all the rest of biology. Or you could say that, well, actually, biologists of all different persuasions have appropriated the tools of molecular biology. Um, and there was a time when departments split. And you had departments of molecular biology, and departments of organismal biology by various names. It happened in Berkeley. It happened a lot of places. And now, that's not so good anymore because they're come, they've come together. And the molecular biologists, as, as a friend of mine, a molecular biologist said, you know, when I commented on how evolutionary he was in his research plan, molecular biologists say so micro RNAs and plants. But anyway, he said, well, I realized that if I want to understand these molecules I'm interested in, which are really important in the life of a plant, I have to understand their history. If I want to understand their history, I've got to understand their evolution. So it's not just that molecular ideas faded evolutionary ideas, it was the other way around too. And I think that there's some development that suggests to me that, that the molecular revolutions are ahead of cognition sometimes too hard. And it's kind of, if neuroscience is a substrate of cognition, then molecular biology is a substrate of neuroscience. And I think that's going to have very, very, very big effects. Like it's hard to predict what they'll be. It's, it, it may not happen. Uh, you know, we're sitting here, I'm sitting here, at least looking out at the ocean, 
and you, you see a wave out there, it looks like it's going to make it to shore. This one looks pretty big to me, but it's still a little ways out there. And I think, I, but I, I'm, and I think there's some really interesting things that strongly suggest this is going to be one of the really interesting frontiers. If I was a graduate student post in animal cognition and interest, especially interested in subtrace, I'd make sure I learn some molecular biology. Uh, enough to understand it well enough to collaborate with people, with nothing else. And, you know, and, 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 I, I'm, I don't think I'd be saying this if I had you know, biology for you and taught freshman biology so that I know enough of molecular biology to get some of the implications I would never have gotten otherwise. <laughs> so I think that's going to be a really interesting challenge. I mean, I'm not a reductionist. I, I, don't, I, mean, I, don't, I don't object to reduct people who take a reductionist approach, but it doesn't appeal to me much. But this one, I think, is going to be big. We know, I mean, logically, we know that when an animal learns something, remembers something, that, that something in the nervous system must change structure. And we've never had really any good idea of what the mechanisms are that might cause those structural changes. I think we're going to know what they are. We're going to learn what they are over the next two years. And I think that's, that that's going to be really interesting for all. Well, maybe I won't say, but younger people will say. So, picking up on younger people, I'll ask you one more question. Okay. And uh, if if you had someone come into your office and they were like, Dr. Camel, what book should I read right now? What would you tell them? I guess I'd ask them what they're interested in. Well, <laughs> comparative copies. And I'll, t I'll tell you what I require my graduate students to do, whether they're in psychology or biology, because they have students from both disciplines. I mean, at the moment, I have two biologists and two psychologists. When I tell them when they're interviewed, when they're accepted, that if they come to work with me, I would expect them to get a fundamental, take some of the basic courses in cognition in the psychology department and neuroscience. Some of the basic courses in ecology and evolution in biology. And so, those are some of the requirements of the psych department and some of the requirements of the biology department. Uh, and neither department has a lot of course requirements, so it's doable better each other. And psychology now accepts some of those biology courses. They were very reluctant to do it at first. <laughs> it's a funny story. I just, I mean, I mean the, the graduate committee in psychology thought that we were trying to get them out of the hard courses into some easy courses. Mm -hmm. And I just laughed at them. <laughs> I just, I just laughed. <laughs> if anything, it's the other way around in terms of the, you know, the chronic idea in a lot of ways. But anyway, so that, I mean, I, I, and I really believe in reading broadly, you know, I mean, if you haven't read Darwin, you need to read Darwin. If you haven't, uh, there's so many things out there that are, that are, that are important to read. I, I don't know a specific book. Um, I don't like to read it. I don't know. I, 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 yeah, I, mean, just, I just don't even know a lot of different things. So, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I guess I'd, I'd have to talk to them and find out what they're doing there, what they do, what they're interested in. But I would want them, I would want the result of their reading to be kind of a broad, basic knowledge of some of the basic ideas of ecology and evolution and of cognition. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you should like to think of sensation, perception, uh, uh, mechanisms of learning course, a neuroscience course, mm -hmm. and a minimum mm -hmm. in psychology, for example. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, a lot of people choose not to come when I tell them that. <laughs> and a lot, but a lot do. And, mm -hmm. uh, and the ones that don't come probably shouldn't come if they don't want to do that. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that would be my answer. To that. I'm sure. If an alpha and alpha and watch, <laughs> Is there anything else you'd like to comment on? No, it's, it's, it's really been interesting to walk around. You know, this meeting is always really interesting meeting for me, or for all of us, I think. And walk around and see, see how a lot of things have changed and some things happened. <laughs> and uh, to see you know, a, lot, a lot of really interesting work going on. It's a very, it's, it's a very, animal coverage is a really interesting field, and it's attracted a lot of people in a variety of ways and a lot of press attention. Um, 
but I don't know that it has a clear home. You know, I mean, there are a lot of psychology departments that are not very interested in developing strength in that area, which is a problem, and it's unfortunate, and, and it's a mistake, I think, by psychology departments. Um, the other big thing is that just when I got started in this stuff, it's hard for me to describe to people how much resistance I had. I mean, I really felt like I was struggling to swim upstream because a lot of the biologists' attitude was, "Money is just not important." You know, I know you psychologists are blah blah blah, you know, but money is just not important. And a lot of and, and most psychologists say, you know, said, "Well, we, you know, we don't care what goes on the field. That has nothing, you know, natural in nature. It has nothing to do with what we study." I remember Jeff Bitterman saying to me when I talked about my neck or my field study of neck before he, he, got, he was, I did that work, it wasn't the visiting university, why he was on the faculty there. I said it sat in on his learning course when I wasn't in the field club in David. <laughs> you know, Jeff was not generous with his compliments. Uh, I think it's fair to say. And he came up to me afterwards and he said, you know, I can really see why you're interested in this stuff. But oh, it's not psychology. <laughs> and I said, well, Jeff, you're wrong. <laughs> we can talk about it. But, but there's a lot of that kind of attitude. And that's clearly changed, and there are a lot of biologists studying it. Uh, it's trying to be really important in a lot of situations, in places I would not have expected, like a lot of insect learning. It turns out to be a really important component of biological success. And there are a lot of ecologists who do very studies in insects. And I, I, I think that that was partly due to my efforts to communicate with biologists, uh, which, which I've always tried to do look, for a long time. And uh, so that, that's pleasing to me. It's pleasing to me to see biologists at these meetings. And it's just changed 20 years ago. I was with the one very many. I didn't start coming myself until 15 years ago. Uh, so uh, so that's, that's interesting too and uh, encouraging. Well, thank you very much, Alan. Thank you, Comparative Cognition Society.